This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Uh, we're now going to look at uh, control accounts, uh, which are another way in practice of uh, checking uh, the accuracy of uh, our recording uh, and make uh, quite a popular little question in the exam. Uh, and before I do, let's have a very quick bit of revision of books of prime entry um, that um, we looked at several chapters ago. And so very, very quickly here, uh, I mean, if I go too fast and you've forgotten it, go back to the chapter on books of prime entry. Uh, but if you remember, if we make sales on credit, uh, the first thing we did uh, was list every sale in our book of prime entry, uh, we'd list it in uh, the sales day book or the receivables uh, day book or the receivables journal. And so let's suppose uh, we made sales uh, to Mr. A of uh, 500, Mr. B of 200, Mr. C of 100. And then when we came to the end of the month, we did two things. For the double entry, we took the total in the book, 800. And the double entry for sales on credit, uh, we took the total. Uh, we debited receivables uh, with 800. Uh, and we credited sales. I'm not going to show the uh, credit entry. But the double entry in the books, debit receivables, credit sales. So we knew what the total receivables were at that stage. But uh, to keep track of um, who actually owes us that 800, remember we also had the receivables ledger. Uh, where we'd have a little account for each individual customer. Mr. A, Mr. B, Mr. C. Uh, and we make a note on each account that A, A owed us 500, B, 200, uh, C, 100. But remember, the uh, receivables ledger was memorandum only. There was no double entry there. That was just to keep track of who owed us what. Uh, the actual double entry uh, in the nominal and general ledger, debit total receivables, credit sales. And still revising, obviously during the month we like to have received cash from customers, so in the cash received book, all right, you'd have your total column and you'd have all your analysis columns, but every receipt would have been listed. Maybe Mr. A uh, paid us 400. Mr. B paid us the full 200, and maybe Mr. C has paid us nothing. And so again, at the end of the month, we take the total of 600. And the actual double entry, we'd be debiting the cash account and crediting receivables with the total cash received of 600. Well, there's the actual double entry, debit, cash, credit, receivables. But again, we keep a note for each customer in the receivables ledger. Mr. A, oops, Mr. A has paid us 400. Uh, Mr. B, 200. Mr. C, zero. And finally, at the end of the month, the balance on receivables was 200. No problem. There's the total we're owed. That's what would appear on the statement of financial position. But who owes us that 200? Well, we take a balance on each memorandum account. Mr. A owes us 100. Uh, Mr. B owes us nothing at all. Mr. C owes us 100. And of course, we can do our list of balances. Uh, what was it? A owes us 100. 
B owes us 100, C owes us 0, a total of 200. Uh, and obviously the two are the same. They must be the same. The, this, the total 200 is what appears in the statement of financial position. There we don't need to show who owes us anything. But for our own benefit, we need to know who owes us the money. Uh, we get that from the receivables ledger. We know who it is we need to chase, Mr. A, Mr. B, and so on. Again, there's nothing new there, and similar things will happen with uh, purchases on credit. But we did all that in books of prime entry, uh, and I said at the time, uh, not only do we need to know who owes us the money, which is why we need the receivables ledger, but it does also act as a check. That, you know, for instance, we could have um, added up the receivables journal wrongly. Uh, we got a total correctly of 800, but suppose we added up wrong and got 900 by mistake. You know, bear in mind, in practice, there are a lot more items. It's much more likely you might make a mistake. Uh, and if we got a total of 900, we'd have put 900 in total receivables. We'd have ended up with a balance of 300. It's wrong. However, the receivables journal, uh, sorry, the receivables ledger, I do beg your pardon, we entered each figure separately. 500, 200, 100. The total wasn't relevant there. And so, receivables ledger, when we came to list the balances, they'd still say 200. The receivables account says 300. We'd know there was a mistake. And in practice, it'd be our job to go back through what we'd done and check everything. Here we'd find there was an addition mistake. We'd put the total right. Uh, and then things would agree. So it does act as a check. And you'll see later, um, questions in the exam can effectively be having you do that check. But I'll look at how it's asked in the exam uh, in the following lectures. However, all of that uh, was, I keep saying, meant to be quick revision. However, there are three extra entries which I've not mentioned so far, which I think you'll find very easy. Uh, three extra entries that can occur, uh, which tend to occur in the sort of control account questions we're coming to. And incidentally, sorry, I, I haven't mentioned, but again, I had in the earlier lecture, total receivables... The other name for it is Receivables Ledger Control Account. All right, the name's not as obvious, but the control account simply means the total account. Um, it's called control account but because it controls the ledger. The total should be the same as the total of the individual balances. However, as I say, there are three extra entries which weren't really relevant until now, but will be relevant in the questions we're coming to, which are returns, discounts and contract entries. And let me explain each of them with a little example. Uh, first of all, returns. If you look at the next page, the second page of the notes, you'll see a little example. It says, suppose we sell goods for 500 on credit to Mr. X. A week later, Mr. X returns half the goods to us. And I've said we accept the return. You know, you can't have customers just always sending goods back. But perhaps Mr. X decided he didn't need them all. We agreed to take them back. Well, what's the entry? When we sell the goods, all right, we do everything in total, I know, but just for this one item, when we sell the goods, we debit receivables with 500, and we credit sales. No problem, and usually that's the end of it, obviously. However, if Mr. Uh, whoever it is, Mr. X, uh, returns half the goods to us, then 
assuming we accept it, he doesn't owe for all of them, he only owns for the remainder. And so we credit receivables with 250, half the goods, and he now only owes us for the half he's kept. Uh, the balance, the remainder, 250. And the double entry. Uh, I'm not, to be honest, terribly worried here, because in the questions we're coming at, we'll just be looking at total receivables. Uh, but the double entry. Um, you could, in fact, do two things, but the obvious one is debit sales. Uh, in that it turns out we've only actually sold goods, the half that he kept, the, the 250. Uh, I said the alternative, you could have a separate account for returns and debit returns. Uh, but on the statement of financial position, you would show, uh, sorry, profit or loss, you'd show sales less returns. So effectively, we'd end up with net sales of 250 and 250 owing. So I think that's a very sensible one. I hope you'd agree. An easy one. Uh, but it's in the questions that, that are coming that you know, returns is one of these sort of extra entries that, that there could be. Okay, so that's one. The next one, discounts. Now, a discount, there are two reasons why we may give discounts or receive discounts from suppliers. Um, one is, it's quite common to offer a customer a discount uh, for buying large quantities, a quantity discount. You know, maybe we normally charge $100 for whatever it is we're selling, but if somebody's prepared to buy a large amount, we'll say, okay, you can have a 5% discount for being a good customer or a big customer. Now, that is no problem. Um, if it's a quantity discount, uh, maybe they bought goods which normally cost um, 1000 because it's a large quantity, maybe we give them a 10% discount. And so we'd only actually charge them 900. That's the amount that would be on the invoice, that's what we've ended up charging them. In which case, debit uh, receivables, credit sales 900, exactly as normal. The only effect of uh, this discount um, is in the arithmetic, it reduces the amount we actually invoice. Now that's no problem, however, what is more, uh, what I'm more concerned with is what we call an early payment discount. And what this is, Suppose normally customers take two months to pay. And we say, OK, um, we allow you to take two months to pay, but if you're prepared to pay early, if you'll pay after one month, we'll give you a discount. It encourages them to pay sooner. Obviously, the sooner people pay us, the better. We get the cash in. If we've got an overdraft, if our overdraft goes down, we, we save interest. But to encourage people to pay quick, we say, right, we're invoicing you a, a thousand, but if you pay us quickly, then you can have a discount. And it works both ways. Obviously, we might offer the discount to customers to pay us early, or equally our suppliers. They may offer us a discount if we pay early. And so look at the example, still on the second page of the note and the discounts, it says suppose we buy goods for a thousand on credit from Mr Y. He offers us a five percent discount if we pay the invoice within one month. 
Now we receive the invoice. The invoice we receive is for a thousand. And whatever we might intend to do, on the day we get the invoice, we, we're not going to be sure whether we're going to pay early or not. We, you know, we don't know how much cash is going to be available. And so when we get the invoice, we've got to record the full amount owing. We're buying goods, and so we'll credit payables with a thousand. That's the amount they've invoiced us. That's the amount we might end up having to pay. And we debit purchases. <coughs> now they have offered us a discount if we pay within a month. If we don't pay within a month, we'll have to pay the full thousand. Credit cash, debit payables a thousand. That's the end of it. But here it says we do pay the account within a month and therefore we'll only pay 950. A 5% discount, the invoice was a thousand, so a 5% 50 pounds discount, dollars rather. Uh, and so the cash will pay is 950. And when we pay credit cash debit payables, 950. However, we obviously can't leave it like that. If we leave it like that, it looks as though we still owe the remaining 50, and of course we don't. Because we paid early, we've got that discount. And so we need to clear off that 50. How are we going to clear it? Well, if we debit payables with 50, that's now correct, obviously. We don't actually owe anything. The double entry, we debit an account for discounts received. So debit payables, credit discounts received. And it's like a little bit of extra income. The cost of the goods was a thousand. Debit purchases a thousand, that will appear on the statement of profit or loss. But we've got a little bit of what you might call other income. It'll appear on our statement of profit or loss. Discounts received uh, 50. So again, I hope the entry makes sense. Uh, and again, think back to what I was saying before about the books of prime entry. Uh, not only will we need to make that entry in the nominal, the general ledger, to make sure we end up with the correct total payables, but we'll also have to make the same entry in Mr. X's account in the payables ledger to show that Mr. X isn't actually owed anything. And incidentally, as far as terminology is concerned, uh, if we get a, a discount from a supplier, we call it a discount received. If we give a discount to a customer, we call it a discount allowed. Uh, but in fact, the way we deal with discounts given to customers is a little bit different. Rules have changed from what they used to be, and I'll deal with that in a later chapter. Uh, finally, these, I said there were three extra entries you might see in the sorts of questions that are coming. Um, what might look an unusual one, something called a contra entry. Uh, and to explain what it is and how we deal with it, look at um, the example on the third page of the notes. It says, suppose we sell goods on credit to Mr. Z for 800. Well, if we sell goods on credit, without going back all the way through the books of prime entry and so on, if we're selling goods on credit on total receivables, there's 800 debit receivables, credit sales, 800. I'm not going to show the credit entry. Uh, and, of course, um, Mr. Z's account in the receivables ledger 
We'd make a note there. It was Mr. Z. We'd make a note that he owed us 800. No problem, nothing new. However, Mr. Z also happens to be a supplier. And we buy goods from him on credit. May not happen a lot, but it does. There can certainly be um, people that you buy from and that you sell to. And so it says, Mr. Z happens to be a supplier. We buy goods from him for a thousand on credit. Well, what happens when we buy goods? If you buy goods on credit, you credit payables. Here it was a thousand and debit purchases. And of course, at the same time, we'll make a note in the payables ledger on Mr. Z's account that we owe a thousand. That's what we always do when we sell on credit, when we buy on credit, there are the entries. And then of course, even though it's the same person, uh, Mr. Z may pay us the 800, debit cash credit receivables. We may pay Mr. Z 800, uh, 1000 rather, uh, credit cash debit payables. No problem. But because it happens to be the same person, we might agree with Mr. Z that instead of him paying us and then us paying him, why don't we just agree that, oh, he owes us 800, we owe him 1,000. We'll just pay you the difference of 200. And that's what it says here. We agree with Mr. Z that instead of him paying us in full and us paying him in full, we'll pay to him the net amount of 200. Well, what's the bookkeeper going to do? We're paying a supplier whenever we pay a supplier. Credit cash debit payables and of course make a note on Mr. Z's account. So, so far nothing different. Whenever we pay cash to a supplier for goods on credit, credit cash debit payables. But of course we can't leave it like that. If we leave it like that, whoever's in charge of receivables will be chasing Mr. Z for that 800 and whoever's in charge of payables, they'll think, oh, we owe 800, and the danger is we'll pay him, when we've agreed not to. And so once we agreed that we were going to cancel one against the other, we better make sure that we tell the bookkeepers responsible what we've done, and that we're not owed 800, and we don't owe 800 either. And so, what's the entry? What entry is going to be needed to cancel those 800s? Surely, we'll credit receivables. Mr. Z doesn't owe us anything. That's what we've agreed. And at the same time, we'll debit payables. And again, we don't owe anything, which is what we've agreed. And that entry is called a contra entry. It's what you might call a pure bookkeeping entry. Um, you know, there's been no transaction of 800. We haven't paid anything. He hasn't paid us anything. But we had to have that debit and credit to put it right, to cancel what they owe us with what we owe them. And the entry is always the same. We always debit payables to reduce what we owe. And the double entry, we credit receivables to reduce what they owe us. So although I mean, it's important you see why we're doing it, and I hope I've made that clear, in fact, it's the easiest entry of all to deal with because it's always the same. If ever there's a contra-entry, 
you're reducing receivables, reducing payables, debit payables, credit receivables. And of course, not only must you make the actual entry in the um, general nominal ledger, total receivables, total payables, but we'd better make a note, or tell the bookkeepers to make a note in the receivables ledger and the payables ledger. 800, 800. So that in both cases, uh, the account with Mr Z ends up with zero balance. So that's a contra entry. It's a matter of interest, if you ever see it at work. Uh, the symbol we tend to use is C with a line through it. Uh, for the exam, though, that's irrelevant. You can obviously see C's with a line through it. But any mention of a contra entry, cancel receivables, cancel payables, debit payables, credit receivables. All right, well, I hope each of those made sense. Uh, I did say at the start of this lecture, there are two types of questions you can be asked on control accounts, total receivables, total payables. And so, in the next two lectures, I'll go through an example uh, of each of the two types.